This is Catherine Lamprecht, Chicago Foodways Roundtable, March edition. And who knew we were even doing kind of like the St. Patrick's Day edition, though Chicago seems to have done most of its uh, celebrating this weekend. So maybe we're past St. Patrick's Day, but probably not quite. So our program tonight is with Lucy Long. Um, she has spoken to us before on apples, which she's presently writing a book on. This last time we encountered her was in, uh, in 2019. Uh, the podcast is somewhere out there for you to enjoy. Um, in fact, the reason we have the program tonight was I've been endlessly sending her information about apples whenever I encounter it in case there's something of use to her. And so uh, she says, by the way, would you be interested on, you know, Irish soda bread? I said, for sure. And so that's how we have our program today was just that kind of an effort. So I'm going to turn it over to Lucy, who tell you all about herself. But she's going to start by showing us how to make soda bread, which is wonderful. So I'm turning it over to you, ma'am. OK, um, if I suddenly if I make some jerky movements, it's because I'm trying to keep my cats. <laughs> <laughs> from knocking everything down, so the usual. So um, I thought before I start talking about some of the ideas about soda bread as heritage, I know everybody just wants to know how to make really good soda bread. <laughs> so um, and before before I do that, I'll I'll give it just a little bit of background on myself. Um, I'm Scots Irish you know, rather than Irish, Irish. And I, I was born in North Carolina um, and, and grew up down there and, and then actually moved over overseas to various Asian countries because of my, my father was in the State Department. Um, you know, but all of that is to say, I grew up feeling very Scottish. You know, we, we would have oatmeal in order to be Scottish and, and things like that. I learned how to play the bagpipes when I was a little kid. <laughs> So, um, however, my husband is Irish, um, Irish Italian, and in the early 1990s, we we moved to Northern Ireland so that he he had a Fulbright and some other fellowships. So we moved to Northern Ireland, and he was he was working there at um, at the Folk Museum in Ulster, and I had three little kids. You know, I wasn't. I was not trying to be an academic or wasn't trying to do anything except survive. And my next door neighbor would bring over the most wonderful soda bread. Um, and I was introduced to all these different varieties of soda bread in different forms in Northern Ireland, which, which I'll talk about soon. Um, so that got me interested in soda bread and I started doing some research on it then and actually wrote one of my very first articles on food was on soda bread in Northern Ireland. And how it was a very distinctive regional tradition in Ireland. Um, so I, I continued working with that. And, and then um, my youngest child, my daughter, um, grew up doing Irish dancing. And so she decided she wanted to go to Ireland <laughs> and pursue Irish dance and pursue a, um, a master's degree in anthropology of dance at the University of Limerick. So she has been over there since 2015. And as an excuse to justify going to visit my daughter, <laughs> I started doing more research on, on soda bread. Um, and then recently I've been looking at it more as heritage and I'm actually working with um, people kind of scattered around the country at various universities, one in Dublin, one in Cork, and we're trying to get something going in Westport um, and also in Belfast. And we're trying to develop a culinary tourism trail on soda bread um, as a way you know, teach people about the history of the country, particularly in the North, teach people about the sectarian differences, the troubles and all. So, so um, you know, this is, I think, fairly typical for a lot of us. You know, we work with what we have. And since my daughter's in Ireland, <laughs> I might as well work with Irish soda bread. Okay, so, so in December 
um, just of this past year, I went over to visit her. And I um, I was asked to be an outside adjudicator for a food studies master's degree program at the University of Cork. So I went, I took the train down to Cork, the bus to Cork, and Regina Sexton, who was a food studies scholar there, excellent scholar, um, showed me around and she took me over to the Bally Malo Cookery School, okay, which is the most famous, is the first and the most famous cooking school in Ireland. And I had actually met the people who were involved in this um, previously in, in, in 1992 or three, when, when I was there and I'd gone to a conference. There were not very many people studying Irish food. You know, and a lot of people, even now, you say Irish food, you say, well, what, beer, potatoes, you know, <laughs> you know, so it was fairly easy to meet, meet the stars. So, but they, um, they showed me around. And so this is, this is almost like a little advertisement for Bally, the Bally Millow Cookery School to thank them for the wonderful free lunch that I had and the free cooking lesson. Okay, so this is the Bally Millow House and Restaurant. Um, and, and definitely look up um, their website. They have wonderful recipes on there too. And all over Ireland, you can purchase jams and preserves that are that are produced by Bally Malo. And so they're they're very very famous. Tomato relish was one of their very first things. Just a very quick history. Um, Myrtle and Ivan Allen purchased the farm um, or. It, it was a castle actually from, from the 1400s. Um, you know, they, they purchased it in 1948. They were not wealthy. You know, they, they were working farmers and they purchased it to, to be a farm. And Myrtle was an excellent cook. She had five children. She was trying to find some ways to make some extra money. She started discovering her, her cooking was, was a good way to do that. So 1962, she started writing a food column. She opened a restaurant in 1964 for Irish Country House Cookery. Okay, and this helped to actually establish um, a country house as, as a genre within Ireland. You know, this wasn't, it wasn't peasant food. You know, this was the country house. It was, you know, people who were a little bit better off, who had enough to eat, you know, but you know, it's not, it wasn't presented as fine dining. Okay, and in 1975, she actually received a Michelin star. Okay, so that's, you know, that's pretty significant. Okay, and then she came out with a series of cookbooks, um, the Bally Malo cookbook. So these, these are all things that you can look up if you're interested in Irish food. And then she died in 2018. So um, quite a legacy. It was fascinating when I went to visit them um discovered they were actually Quaker, you know, and most Americans think of Ireland as fully Catholic, but the Cork area, which is a, the, the very southern part, um was was settled in the 1700s by Quakers who were very entrepreneurial and and developed the industries there. Okay, so so this is their recipe for soda bread. Um Okay, and I learned how to make soda bread when, when I was living in Ireland in the early 1990s. And my next door neighbor would say, well, you just throw this in and then throw this and then mix it together and put it on the, on the griddle. And that's it. And it was always delicious when she made it. I would make it and it never worked out. <laughs> so when I, when I did this little um, cookery lesson, there were several tips that I thought I'd pass along to you all, you know, because that's, it's, it's always in the nuances, you know, that, that good food rest. Um, okay, now, first of all, is a plain flour. And flour in Ireland, it com comes from a softer kind of wheat. So um, it's hard to, do, to really replicate that in the U.S. Some people use cake flour. Um, I, I've heard of people Know, using using different types, you know, specialty flours. Um, also, the buttermilk in Ireland tends to be different, a little different from the buttermilk in the U.S. Um, a lot of people would ask me there, 
you know, when I've, I've done a lot of lectures on American food and that type of thing. And people always, they're very polite, but they say, why do Americans always specify that this is grass-fed beef? What else would cows eat? <laughs> you know, because in Ireland, you know, the grass is green all year round and, and the cows definitely eat grass. Um, and and that, that gives a very, very high butter content or fat content to the milk, plus the, the variety of cows that they have tends to be more fat producing apparently. Um, you know, but it makes so it makes the milk very, very rich. So so if you follow all the directions, it's still not going to be exactly the same in the US. Um, okay, now one of the things that's important, you know, is all the dry ingredients have to be in there mixed up. You make a well and you pour in all the milk. Okay, and one of the things that they said was very, very important. You have to make a claw, <laughs> okay? And then, you know, then you make these circular movements, okay? And they were very specific. You know, you start in the center and you go and you go out, okay? And I'll, I'll show you the photos of that in just a minute. But they said, you know, making, making your fingers in the shape of a claw makes all the difference. Um, the dough should be soft, not too wet, sticky, okay? And then you, you know, say, oh, just, just plop it down and work it on the surface. You, you do not need it. Um, that, that makes it too tough. Okay, one of the things that's important is you pat it, and then they kept saying when you pat it, you kind of pat underneath, and that, that helps the air go underneath also. Um, and then you put a deep cross on it, a lot of, you know, the mythology of that is that, you know, people are blessing the bread and, you know, keeping the fairies from, from making it go bad or not rise. Um, you know, but it's a very practical reason. Um, it helps the heat go through it evenly. And then it also breaks into quarters very easily. Okay, so, okay, and the, the, Final sentence here, tip, soda breads are best eaten on the day they are made. <laughs> so, and they're, they're very similar to, to buttermilk biscuits in that way. Um, okay, variations, spotted dog. There are other, other names for this also, you know, and this, th this would be used more for a dessert. And this is frequently what we think of in the U.S. as, as soda bread. Okay, and Stripey Cat, I think that's a name they, they made up. Okay, so just, just some photographs. I mean, this is what it looks like when they make it. <laughs> okay, so I was there in December. You know, it was, um, it does not get as cold there as it does in the U.S. I'm in Northwest Ohio and it snowed all day here. You know, so this was December. We we had jackets on, but it wasn't freezing cold. And you can see, you know, there's there's greenery still. Okay, you walk in and there are apples, homegrown apples. Okay, that come from from their orchard. Okay, and then here I am in the the kitchen of the cookery school. Okay, and Okay, the, the, the teacher is showing me, you know, you pour in all the milk all at once. Okay, and then here I am trying to make a claw. <laughs> and, and, you know, it's, it's a lot harder than, than it seems. Okay, and then she shows me how to pat it. She said, it's very important to, to go underneath a little bit. And that really lets the air underneath and, and helps it crust and also cook through all the way. Okay, and there we are putting on the cross. Okay, and then this is after it has baked and he brings, he brings it out to show me and, and then he taps on it and you know that it's, it's ready because you tap and it, and it sounds hollow. Okay, and then you simply break it in, into four parts. Slather it with butter, <laughs> Irish butter. Okay, and, and there it is. So, okay, so um, that's, that's, 
that's that's just how to make soda bread. Okay, now, and, and to be very honest, this is how I usually make soda bread now. I don't know if everyone's able to see this, but in, in Ireland, they, they sell all these packets, um, you know, varieties. You can buy plain soda, that's just white soda bread, stone ground, wholemeal blend, you know, plain brown. You know, they, they have all these variations that to us, it's all just kind of like whole wheat bread, you know, but um, you, you can really taste the differences. Hey, so, Lucy, uh, yeah. we have a couple of questions since we're talking about the, the, the bread. They yes. wanted to know, how did you cut the cross? Um, with a with a knife, which they, you flour the knife and then and then just just press it down. So but but you, you do put flour on it. Um, also, it's not it's not cooked on a greased um, griddle or greased pan. It's usually a floured pan, um, and even if it's a griddle. So and and the the traditional way of making it would be on on like a cast iron griddle, and that has flour on top. Uh, somebody comment. I have an Irish born friend who insists that you must have. Your soda bought in Ireland. She always brings some back with her. <laughs> well, and it's yeah, you know, these all of these things are different. They're slightly different. Um, the irony of that, you know, is is that commercial baking soda first started being produced in the U.S. Um, you know, but every everything does have slight differences you know the humidity in Ireland changes changes the the way you can cook and the ingredients um you know so it's even possible that you know if the baking soda is being sold in Ireland they they might have done something to it to keep the humidity from affecting it so it's it's very you know as as most of you probably know it's very humid there and that, that really does affect the cooking. That, that's it for the questions for now. Okay. Okay, so um, I, th I think I actually gave you a different title, The Multiple Heritages of Soda Bread. Let, let me get my cat out. Okay, there's, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> there's a cat hiding hiding the bookcase behind me. Um, so th this title I actually used for a conference in Dublin last year that the, the theme of the conference was, was um, food and mobility, so how things travel. So what I was talking, talking about there was how, you know, soda bread in Ireland was just a basic staple. And it was considered a very everyday kind kind of food. In fact, even now, you know, when we talk to people about doing a, a culinary tourism trail on soda bread, say, like, what, you know, why would anyone want that? You know, it's like saying here we're gonna do do a peanut butter and jelly sandwich culinary tourism trail. <laughs> you know, so you know, most most people still just consider it to be a, a basic staple and not very interesting. Um, however, it's starting to be recognized by tourism boards, okay, and, and by cooks and all as, as a heritage food. Okay, so, you know, so what I was interested in was, well, if it's a heritage food, you know, it means different, different types of heritage in Northern Ireland, the Republic of Ireland, and in the U.S., and then who exactly considers it a heritage food? Because not, not, everybody, not everybody does. You know, so, so what we're looking at here is soda bread, but it's also the complexity of heritage. Okay, so I wanna go through some, some of those ideas. Um, it, plus I'll, I'll give you a lot more details on, on soda bread, okay, which I think is fascinating. Okay, so, um, whoops. There are, are three basic styles of soda bread. 
in, in Northern Ireland, they have what's called sotopharyls, okay? And pharyls means um, a quarter, okay? So, so down at the bottom there, you can see the, the sotopharyls, okay? And then in the Republic of Ireland, rather than, they do have soda bread, but they, what they usually have is brown bread, which is soda bread. Um, but a lot of people don't refer to it as soda bread. They just say brown bread. And that's what they, they have for breakfast everywhere. Um, some people don't even know that it's soda bread. <laughs> they, they just call it brown bread. Okay, And then Irish American soda bread tends to be made with raisins um, and sugar. People frequently put in an egg. Okay, this would have been the, the Sunday type of, of soda bread or the, the type of soda bread that's made for special occasions. You know, if the priest is coming, you know, people would make that. Okay, so, so what we see here are, are three different styles of soda bread. Okay, Northern Ireland, um, I don't wanna assume you know, everyone knows the history of this, but, you know, but I don't want to give too much information either. Okay, so, so Northern Ireland, okay, the, the six counties that, that are in yellow um, is a separate nation, a, a separate country from the Republic of Ireland, from the rest of Ireland, okay, and it belongs to Great Britain. Um, and there's there's a very complex political economic history behind that, which I'll I'll get into just a little bit. Um, so you know, so what I was looking at also was was what do people in the U.S. think think of as Irish food? What do they think of as soda bread? You know, how do Irish Americans think of soda bread? You know, and and, th and think of their own food. Okay, does it stand for heritage for them? Okay, you know, also though, when, when we look at heritage, you know, what exactly are we talking about? Um, okay, and I think it's important, we can make a distinction between history and heritage. History simply just being a, a chronicle of this happened, this happened, this person lived, this happened, okay. There's and obviously people are selecting, you know, which events to include and which people. Okay, but but it does tend to be more more a list of facts. Okay, whereas heritage is more a concept. Okay, it's more our perception of that past. Okay, something that is passed down from previ from preceding generations. Okay, that's the dictionary um, meaning. However. You know, if we look at, at at how people actually use it, and then and how how scholars are looking at it, you know, we see it as the dynamic actualization, adaptation, and reinterpretation of elements from the past attached to a given group, its knowledge, skills, and values. Okay, and the reinterpretation part I think is very important. Okay, and then Barbara Kirschenblatt Gimblet, um, who is is one of the leading folklorist, anthropologist, you know, does wonderful stuff on, on Jewish food culture. Um, and also a lot, a lot of very important theoretical approaches to food as, as art and communication. Okay, she, she writes, heritage is a mode of cultural production that has recourse to the past and produces something new. Okay, so the idea of heritage is that, you know, we, we think about who we want to be in the future and how we want people to see us now. And then we go, we pick out the things from the past. <laughs> and, you know, so, so heritage is all about how, how we really want to see ourselves. Okay? And then that affects how we interpret what happened in the past. Okay, so soda bread is, is bread that the raising agent is bicarbonate of soda, okay, plus buttermilk or some other acid. Okay, so it's it does not use yeast. I mean that's that, that's the basic distinction, you know, for for Europeans and, and Americans that soda bread is not using yeast. 
it's it's not using or traditionally it was not using baking powder either. Okay, um, now you know we tend to think of it as very very traditional, very old. I was very surprised when I started doing research on this though, and it there, there were other types of things potash ashes you know could be used as um, as, as rising agents. However. It really wasn't until the late 1770s, 1771 in France, that soda ash chemists discovered this um, and, the, and discovered how to make it also. 1801, Berlin. 1840s, um, in England, they started discovering that you could put cream of tartar, mix that with baking soda, okay, and that that would take off some of the kind of metallic feel. Um, you know, 1835 and 1830, and then again in 1836, it, 1835, apparently um, it did start being produced commercially in, in the US. 1846, they actually had factories. Okay, in 1856, it was baking powder was added into it. Okay, now what I think is interesting about this Okay, if it started being produced commercially in 1835, you know, we we tend to think of it as being much older in Ireland. Okay, and apparently women, or I say women, because it usually usually was women doing the cooking, um, you know, they could go to the chemist and get bicarbonate or sodium bicarbonate. Um, you know, so so they they could get the ingredients, and then they would also have to mix it with some other things. Okay, so when it started being produced commercially for the use of bread, that was 1835. Okay, you know, so that's that, that's actually much more recent, you know, than most of us really are aware of. Okay, so um, the geography of soda bread. I'm going to talk about Northern Ireland first. And that's partly, partly because um, Northern Ireland and Ireland were, you know, were obviously they're all one island. Um, however, the northern part in the in the 1500s, 1600s, um, Scottish rebels were taken and and put into Northern Ireland. It was called the Plantation of Ulster. And so they were taken out of Scotland, you know, where they were um, rebelling against the English king, and they were put into Northern Ireland, um, basically to be kind of to be slaves there. And initially the Scots and the Irish joined together to fight against the English. And the English realized, you know, divide and conquer. So they, they they took almost all legal rights away from the Irish um, natives and and gave legal rights to the to the Scots. Okay, and then it happened, you know, that the Scots were mostly Presbyterians, Protestants, and the Irish were Catholics. Um, the English, or the Church of England, the Anglican. So there, there, there was a lot of religious stuff going on. You know, this was during King Henry VIII. You know, and he basically started a new church so that so that he could divorce his wife. <laughs> okay, so a lot a lot of history here that I'm giving you the Reader's Digest version of it. Okay, but what's important here is because of that history, Northern Ireland was always very closely associated culturally. So, and you can see it's not, it's not that far from Scotland. There, there was always a very close connection between Northern Ireland and Scotland, you know, and then legally and politically with England. Okay, so that there are some words, the, the word farl can, does come from Scots Gaelic, um, you know, and there are some traditions that, that tend to be a little bit more Scottish. Okay, now, because it's, Northern Ireland is technically Protestant and part of Great Britain. There's a feeling, you know, that they're not really Irish, you know, so by, by people in the Republic, 
<laughs> and so a lot of people in the north feel a little bit like, you know, they're they're they, they don't they don't get the credit that they deserve. Um, at the same time, within Ireland, there was a push to get rid of anything that might have come from other cultures. And so that meant there were certain dances, certain musical styles, um, you know, that were that were that were kept out. Um, and, you know, whereas in the North, people just went ahead and did whatever they always had done. Okay, so there's almost more continuity in a lot of the cultural traditions, in the music and the dance and language, and also in, in the food in Northern Ireland than there is in Ireland. Okay, and that's, that's a very important thing to understand because people are very sensitive to whether or not they're really Irish, okay? Okay, so within Northern Ireland, the farl is ubiquitous and it is something that um, is eaten any time of day. It's always, it's always there for breakfast, but frequently for afternoon tea. Um, you know, and, and you can see it looks a lot like an American buttermilk biscuit, okay, but and, and actually does taste like that too. Um, okay, so there are lots of varieties you can see here. This is this is from a market in Belfast, fruit soda, wheat and soda, plain soda. Okay, and then these can also be purchased in the store. Here's treckle soda. Treckle is a form of molasses. Um, you know, these can be purchased in the store, any bakery, and people make them at home. You know, it's so ubiquitous that people don't even think about it until they leave and suddenly discover that they don't have these <laughs> everywhere else. Okay, and usually they would be toasted. They could be, they're, they're all, almost always split um, horizontally, toasted, and, you know, people use them as a pizza base you know, or just slather butter and jam and put cheese. You know, they're, they're very, very um, useful in a lot of different ways. Okay, and there now are a lot of new flavors that people are trying to do. Bacon, cheese, and scallion, bacon and cheese. Okay, and here you see it in a traditional Ulster fry, which everything is fried. It's up at the top there, along with potato bread too baked beans, and that would be bacon down at the bottom, um, pudding and mushrooms and sausage. Okay, and, and then they also are used um, for a, a sandwich, you know, and it, it would just be called a, a Belfast or, now, now people are starting to say, oh yeah, this is Northern Ireland, you know, but they usually do call it an Ulster fry sandwich. Okay, so the the thing that's interesting about um, the the thing that's interesting about about the soda bread, okay, is this tends to cut across all sorts of um, sectarian. They they use the word sectarian to re refer to different religious communities. So. The, this cuts across the sectarian divides, class lines. Um, it's seen as it, it is shared by everyone. And it's not even considered heritage. People say, well, no, I mean, heritage is in the past. We eat this every day. You know, it can't be heritage for us. It's just, it's just our food. Um, you know, but people are now suddenly starting to be aware, partly because of you know, people like me coming over and talking to them, you know, that this is unique and it is something that they all share. Okay, even though they're different musical styles, different dance styles, you know, for Protestants and Catholics. However, they all eat this kind of bread. Okay, so it makes it very, very distinctive there. Okay, meanwhile, in Ireland, brown bread tends to be the ubiquitous everyday bread. Okay, and this is frequently made at home, but you buy it everywhere. You know, this is obviously from the supermarket. Okay, and here, I'm trying to get my cat off. 
sorry about that. <laughs> okay, so, um, so brown bread is almost always eaten for breakfast. It is also served with soup. Okay, and, and soups in Ireland are always what they call blended. Um, you know, whatever you have in there is blended up. Um, okay, so it's, it's also very, very ubiquitous. Okay, here, here it is again. Okay, and it is starting to be considered um, or recognized as something that that can be used as a resource for, for like fine dining. Okay, so 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 this is actually a fancier meal, as you can see here. Okay, and chefs are trying to come up with things to do with it. You know, that would be you know, what we could refer to as elevated cuisine or just innovative cuisine. Okay, and so this is an Irish full breakfast rather than an Ulster fry. Very, very similar. Um, the beans are not on the plate, but you can see a black and white pudding, as liver pudding and blood pudding. Okay, and then you can see the brown bread um, in the basket. Okay, so that's that would be standard everywhere. Okay, now there also are starting to be um, kind of a, a resurgence of going back to the more traditional bread. Okay, and frequently when, pe when people say brown bread, they mean the loaf that I just showed you and that's sliced. And then when they say soda bread, they're frequently referring to what they think of as an older, more traditional kind, kind of bread. Okay, and this, this is at a market. Um, this is, you, you, can, you can see, you know, it's kind of being presented as more rustic too, okay? Artisan breads. Okay, so, so there's, there's, there's a real sense that these, that soda bread is older, okay? And here's, here's the mix that I showed you earlier, <laughs> okay? Established 1845. Okay, so now the interesting thing about in Ireland, is people tend to think of the soda bread as being very, very traditional and related more to, um, there's like an idealized peasant past for, for, for Ireland. They, you know, they've, they've tried to develop dance and music as something that comes out of, out of these idealized peasant lives, you know, and we all know, you know, if you read any anything about what peasants were actually going through, especially during during the famine, um, th these were not lives, you know, that were pleasant at all. Um, you know, so 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 there's a little bit of romanticization going on there. Okay, so and then Irish American soda bread. Um, I mentioned I mentioned that this would be the Sunday type of bread, the special bread. This is a lot more expensive. It uses frequently an egg, sugar, and um, and currants, and you know. So so this would be safe for special occasions for for when the priest is visiting. Okay, a lot of this, you know, why why is it that that in the U.S. we think of soda bread as the special type? A lot of this goes back to the history of the Irish in the US, okay, so just, just very quickly, in the 1700s, Irish who were coming over tended to be Protestant, either Anglo-Irish or Scots-Irish. Um, and so many of these, because they were Protestant, they assimilated very easily. Um, also, a lot of the Scots-Irish went into the Appalachian Mountain region, you know, where they became hillbillies, you know, as, as people would refer to them. Um, and, you know, that's, that, that's my ancestry. Okay, but they were Protestant, you know, so, so they were still considered American. Okay, and that's, that's, that's very, very important. Because in the 1800s, the Irish who started coming over the 1830s, 1840s, um, and then particularly 1850s, 1860s, were primarily Catholic, okay, and there was there there was a real feeling, you know, Catholics were not were not true Americans. They they were not considered Christian, um, 
And then the ones who are coming over with the famine, they generally were not in the best of health. You know, they had been suffering. Um, they tend to be very poor. And the English had, um, had they kind of had a campaign to, to treat the Irish as, as inferior. Um, and they would, they, there were cartoons coming out of English newspapers, you know, showing the Irish looking like apes, um, you know, and presenting them as, as less than human. Okay, so a lot of those attitudes carried over in the U.S., okay, partly because of the, the Protestant um, main, mainstream in the U.S. Okay, and so there were, there were laws, you know, no, no Irish need apply, the sundown laws. Um, Irish people were not allowed to be in certain places after sundown, okay? And you can, you know, we think of that usually with African Americans, but it was also with Irish and other immigrant groups. Um, and my favorite story about that is where I live here in Northwest Ohio, a canal was being, was being built from Lake Erie. And this was in the 1810s, 1820s. And it was mostly Irish laborers who were being used, okay, particularly 20s, 30s, and 40s, because they were, it was very dangerous work and they were considered less valuable than slaves. You know, an Irishman's life was, was worthless, basically. And so they frequently were working, building these canals, this very dangerous work. So one of the towns that is only about 10 miles away from me on Lake Erie, on, on the Maumee River going into Lake Erie, they, they had a sundown law that no Irish were allowed to be in the town after sundown. And historical records show that at least two Irish laborers were tarred and feathered and carried out of town. Um, the nice thing about that, or that story is that 10 years late, 10 years after that, there was a cholera epidemic and it wiped out the entire town. So the only thing that's left standing over there now um, is an old mill and the old Catholic church. <laughs> so, okay, so, you know, if Irish people were coming here in the 1800s, you know, this was when soda bread was starting to be made in Ireland and they were coming over here and meeting up with all of this, um, oops, you know, with, with these, uh, with this discrimination, you know, they, they're not likely to say, oh, here's some Irish food, here's Irish bread. Okay, so, you know, they would be hiding, actually hiding their identity. Okay, and this is my, one of my personal theories, I don't, I have no idea if this is true and it's something I, I am trying to look into. Um, American biscuits, buttermilk biscuits, it's exactly the, the same recipe. My, my father who grew up in Appalachia, when he visited us in Ireland and had soda bread, he said, these are biscuits. <laughs> you know, and so I think it's very, very likely that any Irish, who, particularly who, if they were going into the Appalachian mountain region or into the South, they met up with American biscuits, okay? And biscuits were kind of a pioneer food also, okay? So also in, in the Midwest, you know, so it's easier, it's less dangerous, you know, just call your soda bread biscuits instead. Okay, so, you know, that's, that, that's, that's my theory. Okay, and a lot of people say, well, American biscuits are the same as scones and they're not. <laughs> so scones al almost always have, well, they, they always have sugar. They usually have currants or some other kind of fruit, you know, but um, they also have baking powder and they, they have a very different kind of texture from, from, the, from the soda bread. Okay, so in the 1900s, things started changing for the Irish in the U.S., yeah, they started being considered citizens. They're, you know, they had to fight for this. Um, th there tended to be three 
careers that the Irish could have, politicians, publicans, okay, running taverns, um, and priests. Okay, but particularly by the 1950s, 1960s, Irish were, they, they were starting to be considered white, okay, fully white people. Okay, and a lot of people point to John F. Kennedy as, as one of the, um, the reasons the Irish and, and Catholicism started being accepted. Okay, I don't know why I have the junior there. Sorry about that. Okay, but, but also the multiculturalism of the 1960s was expanding who could be an American and was expanding to include Irish and, um, and Catholics. Okay, late 1990s and, and 2020, um, up to 2020. Let me just. Um, okay, the, the Irish started being seen as fully assimilated. Um, there have been studies that say that an Irish voice is considered the sexiest voice. This is my Irish son in law told me that. <laughs> so. Um, but also in the mid 1990s, river dance became popular, and it it brought Irish dance and music to the general public. But it also presented it as as something that it obviously takes a lot of training, a lot of skill to do this dance, a lot of physical stamina, and it was the first time that that Irish culture was being presented in a way that that people felt could be respected and admired okay and and so a lot of scholars really see river dance okay as as one of the things that started a whole shift okay and and how people were thinking of the irish um liam neeson <laughs> this is this is one of my my personal theories again too you know there were there were other irish actors who also started being being very popular. Irish authors were starting to be recognized by mainstream, not, not just by, by literary theorists. Um, 2023, you know, there, there's a whole flood of Irish films. Okay, now I started noticing this shift in, in the mid-1990s because growing up in the South and in, in the Southern mountains, we had always talked about being Scots, Irish, and the emphasis was on the Scottish part. Okay, a lot of people talked about going to Scotland. Okay, and Ireland was not really on, on our radar. Um, and whenever we would ask about that, we started to realize there, there was still a lot of discrimination against the Irish, against Catholics. Okay, but in the mid-1990s, that started shifting. Okay, and, and I remember early 2000s hearing people talk. Yeah, and, and this is all from the perspective of music and dance. People are saying, rather than Scotch-Irish, they'd say Scots-Irish or Ulster-Scots and emphasize the Ulster. You know, so, so there definitely was a shift okay, within the American public. Okay, so that hasn't carried over completely to how people think about Irish food. There is still very, very much, um, you know, the the idea that you know the Irish love to party, so all their food is about parties. Um, I think this is the highest form of hummus, you know, and they and then they have leprechauns, you know. So people are not being all that careful, you know. They're not trying to be all that accurate, you know. But they're emphasizing the luck of the Irish, you know. There's so they're, they're still emphasizing some of those older stereotypes, okay? You know, and, you know, the biggest stereotype of all is that um, the Irish drink all the time, um, you know, and there's, there, there's definitely a lot of alcohol and pubs in Ireland, um, you know, not, not everyone drinks all the time, however, you know, it's, it's, it's like any culture, it's a little bit more complicated. Um, Okay, and what is thought of today, you know, is um, 
at Jig's Dinner. Okay, and and I, I don't know if other people are familiar with Jig's Dinner. It's Jig's, the, the, the name Jig's itself comes from a cartoon. And it was, it was kind of making making fun of um, this character who who is Irish, okay. And you know, so the Jig's dinner is referring to this Irish cartoon character, okay. And corned beef, which was not something that was eaten in Ireland, okay, but came about in the U.S. because the Irish neighborhoods. Um, and, and, and Irish Irish had to stay in cities frequently, partly because because of being Catholic, they were not welcome in a lot of rural areas. Um, and even in in the Toledo area, there there were stories forties nineteen forties nineteen fifties of the Ku Klux Klan chasing chasing any Irish families who settled in in the countryside, chasing them back into the city. You know, they would burn crosses. Um, in, in their yards and things. So the, frequently the Irish neighborhoods were right next to the Jewish neighborhoods. The Irish housewives would go shopping over at, over in the, the Jewish delis, um, you know, and the Irish working men would, would go to the deli to buy a sandwich. Corned beef was very, very cheap. It was one of the cheapest meats. So it started being associated with the Irish because they, they would buy it. Okay, so so with that that whole history of kind of the baggage of of being outsiders and looked down upon um, was 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 very influential on how people wanted to present themselves. Okay, and frequently, if there was an Irish American fundraiser, people would want to have the most expensive, the nicest type of, of soda bread. Okay? They didn't want the rustic kind of thing. They didn't want people to think of them as peasants. Okay? You know, in Ireland, they, they were trying to go back to that or evoke that peasant past. You know, but Irish Americans didn't want to have anything to do with that. They wanted to be modern. They wanted to be um, assimilated as, as much as possible. Okay, so so, so the raisins rather than currants and sweet soda bread became the general form. Okay, now, um, because, you know, we're, we're all thinking of Irish culture in a very different way. Um, a lot of people are, and, and for other reasons too, a lot of people are trying to go back and get the older forms. Okay, a list here, the Society for the Preservation of Soda Bread, okay, which is an American thing that um, it, it, it seems to be one person who's, who's running it, you know, you know, but he actually has a lot of useful information and some good recipes and things. Okay, and then America's Test Kitchen, okay, this, this photograph um, is, is from the recipe for soda bread that they give. And, you know, they're saying, oh, you know, you could put wheat germ and all this other stuff in it, okay, which I, I actually like to do. And that does, does give it more of the feel that, that I would get in Ireland. Okay, so, you know, so now it's being, it's being revitalized. Okay, so the, the whole idea here, though, is people see this bread as coming from the past. Okay, and as representing a heritage, um, you know, but you can see from those different histories, you know, that they represent different things to different people. Okay, and so one of the things we need to look at is, you know, who is thinking of it as heritage? Okay, how is it being used? Okay, and what exactly is the identity? You know, what, is, what does it mean to be Irish when they say Irish soda bread? You know, so with the Ulster Farls, you know, we see a real continuity with the past that affirms that these people really are Irish, okay, even though they're politically and religiously aligned more with Scotland and England, okay. In Ireland, we see soda bread as a romanticization of the past, 
And what people are eating on an everyday basis is brown soda bread, but they just call it brown bread, which kind of represents a whole push towards modernity that started in the 1930s in Ireland, where Ireland wanted to catch up with the rest of the world and be modern. Okay, and now it's like they have gotten there, and now they can look back fondly on their past. Okay, kind of like a successful adult can look back fondly on on their childhood. Okay, so Ireland seems to be at that at that place, you know, but they still are looking back on it. Okay, okay, and and then in the U.S., it tends to be seen now as the Irish are these people who they overcame incredible hardships to come here. They overcame incredible hardships living here and they overcame all the discrimination that was that was being held against them. Um, you know, and so now Irish Americans are just as successful as anyone else. Plus they represent a an approach to life where they enjoy life. I mean, this is the, this is the imagery. <laughs> okay, so that you know, to be Irish American means that you know how to have fun. Okay, and you know, things might be horrible, but you can still find something positive and all of that. So it's seen as, as as a very very positive identity to have. Okay, and a um a very admirable way of living. Okay, so you know, so this. Raisin bread, <laughs> you know, it, it stands for all of that. And Irish Americans can now proudly offer their, their soda bread to guests from anywhere. Okay, so, um, you know, that was the future of soda bread. Who knows? Okay, so, so all of this is to get us thinking about, about heritage. Um, and it's important because... Tourism uses heritage, it plays it up. Um, various governments are, are using heritage to, you know, to, um, to define different groups of people. Um, and and, and it, it, it affects the way that we think of, of these groups of people without even realizing it you know, through, through their bread. It, but also it's just, these varieties of bread, and it's all soda bread, you know, and it's just just so many varieties, and it's really fun to eat. <laughs> so, so we we don't we don't have to get philosophical about it either. It's just you know here's here's you know all these these great breads to eat. So, okay, um, I was trying to make sure I didn't talk too long. I'm not quite sure what time it is. I'm on Eastern <laughs> Eastern time zone, and you know, I think we're all kind of unsure what what day it is, even with the time change. So, do you mind if we go through some questions? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this is back earlier, but you know, with these brown breads, is that you know brown, not white flour? Does is molasses added to it? What's Okay, what? no, no, it is, um, it would be referred to as whole meal. Okay, and let's see, here's whole meal, which mm -hmm. would be what, what we call here whole wheat. So, and it's, it's usually a kind of a softer kind of, kind of wheat. So this, they, in, in the Republic of Ireland, they generally do not add molasses. That would be that that would be in the north. Some of the artisanal bakeries are starting to do that now. But yeah, so it's it's just it's just whole wheat. Okay, well uh, here uh, Eileen said my parents are from the west coast of Ireland. For us growing up, there was a clear distinction between brown bread and soda bread. We also never had it with caraway seeds, which I see in a lot of recipes online. It was a sweeter version. Every party, many of the women would bring their own loaves of soda bread. And while they were, while there were some slight differences, by and large, they were still very similar. But most of the women were from the West Coast, so maybe more of a regional variation? Yes, yes. Well, and... 
generally in the Republic of Ireland, brown bread is, is, is used for the, the whole meal bread. Um, and, and people do not refer to that as soda bread. So it doesn't surprise me at all that caraway is not used, that I've, I've never seen caraway used in the Republic of Ireland, you know, nor, nor in Northern Ireland when I was there. And it seems to be the, the, first, the first published recipe for soda bread actually comes from a cook in Northern Ireland um, it was like 1837. I have to I have to check that in my notes. Um, and she used caraway. You know, so it's it's possible that it's something that was being used in the north. Um, you know, but it's not it's not something that that was widespread. Yeah. And a lot of a lot of people came from the north, and there were northern traditions. You know, that were being established in the U.S. is just Irish American. You know, people didn't make the distinctions. And so it's possible that some of the, you know, some of those recipes were coming from the North. There were questions about, uh, is the history of soda, of baking soda to mean that soda bread didn't happen till the 1800s? And there's been a lot of discussion about ash and some other items from the 1700s. Yes, yes. Well, and you know, there actually are in, in some some of the early American cookbooks, um, there are recipes for soda cake. However, it's not soda bread at all. It's um it's literally a cake you know, that, that is being being made with potash. So and let's see, I can I, I can look up some of the stuff in my notes <laughs> too. So, but it really, it really surprised me, um, you know, to to realize that you know that soda bread really, really did not start being made. It, it did not become a household fixture really until the 1800s. So there were um, there there are. Um, there's there are, there's some documentation of Native Americans using potash as a rising agent, you know. So, you know, people were using some of those things as leavening, you know, but they were not referring to this as soda bread. It wasn't being used um, on, on a regular basis. Okay. So, and and from you know from what I can can figure out is is kind of the same way with buttermilk biscuits. Um, and as a pizza base, I think those were those, whatever, uh, baked first before topping, but my feeling is it's probably just sliced in half and topped. But what, what, how were those pizzas made from oh, yeah. the... Yeah, and, and, and those are the, the farls, um, yeah, the, which you, you can see on the lower left. And farl means a quarter, you know, so, so these were, I, I should also point out that uh, part of what makes the farls in Northern Ireland distinctive is these are always baked on top of a griddle and they're turned over halfway through the cooking. So they're flat on both sides. Okay, so that's, and th that's very, very different from in the Republic of Ireland. Um, usually they, they, they don't do that. <laughs> you know, you know, they, they tend to be baked in the oven and, and they rise so the top is rounded. And so even if they pat the top to be flat, it doesn't, it's not the same as the, the griddle soda, they would call it in the North. So, so when people say Ulster farls, okay, they always are made out of these uh, flat on both sides and they're always round. Okay, so, so the farls, when people purchase them, they're already cooked. And you can eat them just as they are, but people almost always take them home and split them and then toast them. So, and then, you know, so they would, they would split them and then put pizza sauce and cheese on top. So lasagna, actually, <laughs> sometimes people would, would put on top. 
So the, the other thing about the Farls in the North, um, they tended to make them, they would call it plain, if they, if they were made out of white flour, um, or wholemeal, if they were made out of whole wheat flour. And then truckle farls would be usually wholemeal with some molasses, um, if truckle is a form of molasses added to that. You could also get currant farls, and the currants could be both wholemeal or, or white flour. Um, and then also occasionally you could get some made out of cornmeal. Okay, and what your, your viewer mentioned the west of Ireland, part of what happened during the um, during the famines was American aid organizations would take food over and cornmeal was something that, you know, that was used for, to make cornbread all the time in, in the US. And so that was taken over to Ireland and corn, and Ireland was considered an animal food and was not something that was eaten normally. So people were very, very offended and they usually used it to feed their chickens, you know, rather than rather than for themselves. So there are only some very, very poor communities um, in which that really was the only flower that that they had. Um, you know, you know, so there are these um maize you know or you know cornmeal there there's a another word for them that i i i don't remember at at the moment um you know so they're, they're not found very often in in the north and in the west but they were there and then now they're being revived in the north as kind of a health food i thought you'd find this interesting this was made uh, this comment was made before your comment about your theory about biscuits. Uh, oh. Cynthia said, given how many Ulster Scots settled in the American South, including much of Appalachia, it is interesting that there is a strong similarity between the bread of Northern Ireland and the buttermilk biscuits of the U.S. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Well, and... You know, that it, it didn't occur to me until my father pointed out that the soda farls tasted exactly like the buttermilk biscuits that he grew up with. <laughs> so, and and then um, I I have not been able to find any any historical documents to support that, to, you know, to support my my theory. But you know, if people were coming over. You know, during a time when being Catholic and being Irish was not something that was, you know, that was um, looked upon favorably, you know, then they would be likely to hide that identity. And so if they were used to making soda bread and discovered that that people, you know, not not only in the Southern Appalachian region, but also in, throughout the Midwest, you know, people were making buttermilk biscuits. And so they discover that it's the same recipe, the same, the same techniques. Um, you know, so you know, you can imagine that people would then simply call them something else. Um, you know, and, and go ahead and go ahead and call them what, you know, what the culture, the new culture that they're in is calling them. So with the, the Scots Irish, a lot of that. Um, that immigration probably was earlier than, you know, than um, the early 1800s when soda bread came in. So the, the big the big push of Scots Irish going into Appalachia would have been in the 1700s. So, but there always were some people <laughs> going going in. So you know these are these are possible connections that. You know, I'm kind of tossing that out for some historians to look into. Um, Cynthia also pointed out they still serve, or they serve uh, Jigs Dinner in Newfoundland. Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, and and Jigs, I think it was a Canadian cartoon, actually, in the 1930s. 
So, and, and Jigs was kind of this, you know, this um, silly, you know, know-it-all, I think, you know, it's, um, and I, I think he was Canadian. Yeah, so it, it would make sense. And, you know, Newfoundland was, was settled by a lot of Irish also, um, but, but also had, had a very, very strong connection cultural and, and social connection with New York and Boston because of the the ships would go, they would actually go to Newfoundland first and then come down to New York and Boston. You know, so so some of the communities in Newfoundland were seen as as more more cosmopolitan, <laughs> you know, than especially the backwoods areas of 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 the US. You know, so it's it's very possible that that there were things being being shared. Uh, this is a little bit well, uh, absolutely off the uh, soda bread trail. Uh, mm -hmm. It's about corned beef. Yeah. Uh, since they have the same thing in England, but call it salted beef, corn meaning grain and grains of salt make it corned. Would it be? It would be interesting to know whether there was some British influence in the uh, in the adoption of corned beef would have been posh British. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Huh. But, you know, my the, the reading that I have done on it, um, you know, was was that it was a way of preserving the beef, and then it would be used for sailors. Um, or people in the army, but but particularly for sailors, you know. So it was it was a way to to feed people, um, you know, who 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 did not you know have, have regular access to food, and it tended to be the worst quality of the beef, too. So it might in Ireland it might have had a very different history and very different meaning from from in England. That's that, that's interesting, though. Yeah, let's look look into that. <laughs> okay, so I think we've kind of covered the whole topic. Everything that people said in the chat, you'll get a copy of, so you'll get their thoughts and opinions, what have you. Okay. Um, so your next, so so are you writing a book on soda bread, or this was just, or you know, a project that paralleled your family ambitions no this is i'm I, i'm actually i'm actually hoping to do a book on this also um i've i've been working with several universities in ireland um you know teaching classes and, you know with you know doing doing a lot of zoom or you know zoom lectures and stuff for them and you know we've we started realizing this is an incredibly rich topic because there are regional variations within both of them, the Republic and in the North. Um, and then, you know, now that now that Irish food is starting to be recognized as as a cuisine, as a desirable cuisine, <laughs> you know, people are are starting to look at, you know, what what foods can be highlighted um, in tourism you know, and and in hospitality and, and, and the food world, you know, so so people are a lot more interested in it. Um so yeah I'm I am hoping hoping to be able to pursue this further. You know, and you can see just from you know that rundown, that reader's digest version of you know the history of the Irish in America, you know, it's a massive topic. And I've when when I've interviewed people about their experiences growing up Irish American, um, you know, it, it depends so much on where people were living, what their circumstances were. Um, you know, there were these nuances in religion that made a difference, you know. <laughs> you know, so um, you know, if if people are interested in sending me, you know, their um the, their memories of growing up with soda bread. I'd I'd love to get some of that. So I've I've been able to talk to people who grew up in Boston, 
um, and Irish communities, Irish American communities, um, Irish American communities all around here, Detroit, Cleveland, Toledo, um, you know, and I, I, in Chicago, and I definitely would like to hear from people in other parts of the country. I remember I sent you an article um, about Irish soda bread, and it had, to, and they said like the the raisins and the caraway seeds. Uh, you know, that was something that they could do once they became came here because they could finally afford to add these things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's you know the, the the caraway seeds, you know they they seem to be something that uh, cooks in the north were using. Um, you know, and then and it might have just been that those were, you know, they were they were able to afford that, but. Yeah, and well, the you know the raisins. I mean, that, that was one of the few ways people were able to get any kind of fruit, um, you know, during during the winter. You know, was was to have dried fruit. You know, so it was a it, it was functional as well as well as aesthetic, and for taste. You know, and you know, so you know people people would save those things for special occasions, and. A very typical pattern that we see with ethnic foods, you know, groups who move from their culture to another culture, you know, they they, they tend to take the foods that were thought of as their special, like the holiday foods or the special celebration foods. That's what they recreate when they when when they come to a new country, especially if they're presenting their cuisine to someone else. You know, they, they want to present them with the best. You know, so um, it's not surprising that the raising that the raisin soda bread is what was preserved. So, and you're right. You know, it, it's definitely a matter also of people just being able to afford that. You know, and that they could afford to put an egg in, which was something that they did not do in Ireland. So, yeah. So they they made changes like that. Eggs were money. Yes, you can <laughs> use that you know, lightly. Uh, Mercy made the comment, you, not that you have to adjust anything for tonight because you've talked long enough. Uh, thank you for this interesting talk and presentations. I would love it if you could present this subject in the context of the history of leavening in bread. Soda bicarbonate is a very late chapter in the history of humans consumption of breads. But you know what, you have to specialize on something, right? <laughs> <laughs> you made your choices. <laughs> right. Well, and you know, I I do not have a degree in in food chemistry and and food science, so I you know try not to you know step over <laughs> over my my knowledge. So there's a lot of really interesting stuff written about that. Um, again, I, I mentioned the Society for the Preservation of Soda Bread, and that 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 individual and I, I wrote to him and said, you know, do you mind if I mention, you know, you know, use use your website and all. Um so, you know, and he said, fine. <laughs> I think, I think he, he was happy to know someone was taking it seriously. You know, but he has gone through old historical documents and books and just pulled things out here and there. And put those on on his website, you know. And that would be fascinating for someone who 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 does know more about the history of leavening. That's I think he he includes on there also someone suggesting that soda bread is actually Native American. You know that N Native Americans would have been the first to 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 leaven their bread with potash. I don't know if that's true or not. Um, you know, but. It, it's an interesting idea, you know. They, they don't call it soda bread, so is it soda bread? <laughs> you know, that, that, that gets into some other questions. <laughs> well, this was delightful and informative, and well worth the your efforts on our behalf. Thank you, and you know, I hope. Well, if anyone's interested in the recipes, um, I mean, you know, the 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 website for the Bally Malo. Um, it, it, somebody, uh, while you were talking, found those recipes for the brown yeasted, 
for the soda bread that you demonstrated. So we're going to, I'll put that on the Culinary Stories website with a link to their website. So we don't have to worry about offending anybody's copyright. <laughs> okay. okay. Well, and I, you know, frankly, the one, the recipe that I usually, that well, the one that I used before, I always come home with mixes like this now <laughs> after I visit my daughter, you know, but um, I got it from Bon Appetit, you know, that, that was like 20 years ago. And it was the first one that actually seemed to work. I can also, um, you know, if anyone is interested in a copy of the the essay that I did, and you know, for the the conference in Dublin, I can I can send that to people. It has a lot more of the the factual information um, as well as the ideas. So, and then the is that something we could link on to our website, or would you rather they just got uh, a direct copy from you? Just asking. Um. You know, I'll, I'll I'll send you a copy, and and, and I'll give it to whoever to whoever wants yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. Although you know, I'm I'm really looking for feedback. You know, on people's experiences. You know, if they if they grew up eating soda bread, you know, I I'd, I'd, I'd love to hear about that. That's, you know, you know, when I was, I mean, so many people, you know, they grew up in. In Boston, Irish communities, and they never had soda bread, you know. And and someone who grew up in Toledo, which which has a very strong Irish, or it used to have have like two Irish neighborhoods, and his um he grew up. His mother was Irish. He had his Irish grandparents living there with him. He he never had soda bread, <laughs> you know. So so I'm I'm really interested in in hearing about the different experiences. You know, why was it that some families kept it and others didn't? You know, was it a community thing or was it just individual preferences? You know, there's so many different factors in there to look at. Yeah. So and and I, we discovered over the weekend. I mean, I did anyway. You know, Chicago. We have the North Side Irish, we have the South Side Irish, but I only was aware of this last few days. There's the Northwest Irish. So each of these have their own parade. Really? <laughs> and I didn't know about the Northwest Side, uh, but mm -hmm. I do now. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah. And you know that's, I you know I, I also been studying just kind of ethnic food in general, you know, the various patterns of, you know, that happen with ethnic foods in the U.S. And almost always there would be several different neighborhoods, you know, the same ethnicity to everyone else, you know, it's all Polish, you know, <laughs> you know but, but within that community, you know, it's the educated Polish versus the peasant Polish, they call them. And, you know, and, you know, so, so you start seeing all these things like that, all these patterns, and then usually the people who are more educated, more cosmopolitan, were able to assimilate. And, and so the foods that remained is the ethnic foods that, you know, that the mainstream knows about tended to come more from the working class and peasant traditions. You know, so, um, you know, so, so we know, you know, we know of soda bread. You know, and, and and with with Polish food, we know kielbasa and um, and pierogi. You know, <laughs> you know, you know. But there is so much other stuff that you know that the more well-to-do Polish Americans were eating. You know, but that that didn't get preserved because those families assimilated and and moved on. Well, with the many ethnic populations that we have in the United States it sometimes becomes like we're a time capsule of food from when their families came to this country. And I read this guy, he wrote, he does the Scandinavian, new Scandinavian cooks. He mm -hmm. was visiting the United States and people kept offering him potato sausages. He had never encountered that. And when he got home, he then did some research and found out that this was a food that was developed during a period of austerity. You know, everybody was impoverished. And when those people left, that was food that they were eating and they kept it going. But those that were in the home country had moved on. 
to other things. Right. It's no longer in their repertoire. Right, right. And, you know, frequently foods like that become symbolic of, of, of heritage. You know, so people purposely hold on to it. You know, so, you know, when I've interviewed people, you know, Irish Americans, you know, they the only things they can think of are corned beef and soda bread, you know, but there's a lot of other stuff that they could have been eating, <laughs> you know, you know, so, so, so people tend to pick out a couple of things that become symbolic of, of their heritage. So <laughs> I, I had a fascinating, this was in like 2013 through 2016, I think it was, I, I edited a three volume encyclopedia on ethnic food in the US. And it was specifically about how people had adapted. Um, and it was fascinating, you know, because people who, who settled in New York City, they didn't have to adapt as much. They were able to get all the same ingredients, um, you know, and some, sometimes better ingredients, <laughs> you know. But, and then, you know, if someone, if someone settled in, well, in Northwest Ohio, where I live, it would have been very difficult to get to get some of their things, you know, and it was fascinating to see just the variety, the diversity that goes in, into, into all of that. And that, you know, the, the process is so complex. That's fascinating. It, it is. And, and I don't want to be too, but there's a Polish baker who comes to culinary stories from time to time. And she prepares some, she gets requests for food for weddings. That she goes, if she was back in Warsaw, nobody would ask this. But it's here in Chicago. And this is, you know, she says maybe 50, 60, 100 years ago, but not today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. yeah. Just yeah. fascinating. Well, we could be here all night. But I think <laughs> yeah. you need to go to bed. It's like 930 for you. It's 830 for us. <laughs> <laughs> everybody's thanking you and I will send you the chat so everybody's thoughts and opinions you'll get to enjoy okay. thank you so much Lucy thank you and you know this is you know it's it, it's a work in progress too so I'd love to hear from people absolutely and if people want to contact me I'll forward them your address and all that good stuff okay okay all thank righty thank thanks everybody good night Lucy okay good night bye-bye